Okay, um, so I'm going to use this microphone because we're recording things. It isn't broadcasting. So um, it is my great pleasure and honor today to uh, present Eric Jarvis, who's come to speak to us as uh, our first speaker in the BD2K um, uh, speaker series for the summer, which is really, really exciting. Um, so Eric is a highly distinguished scientist, and I'm going to not be able to do him any justice, but I thought I'd kind of give you a potted history of his rough bio. Um, so I was very interested to read that Eric, uh, in graduating uh, from the High School of Performing Arts in New York City, uh, actually had the opportunity to take a dance scholarship um, and chose science in preference to, to dance, which is kind of an interesting <laughs> one, and I think we're all the better for that. Um, but if you want to see Eric dancing, I did look up on YouTube, and you can see him uh, both dancing and dancing with cockatoos as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, after graduating high school, he went off to Hunter College and uh, published six, I read, uh, bacterial molecular genetics papers, which is pretty, uh, pretty outstanding for an undergraduate. Uh, then went on uh, to uh, study under Fernando Nottenbaum, I'm going to mm -hmm. pronounce it wrong, at uh, Rockefeller, where he did both his PhD and then his postdoc and then moved on to Duke University uh, as faculty, where he stayed until very recently, where he has now moved back to Rockefeller and is now overseeing, I think, four or five different labs, which, from what <laughs> I understand. Um, he was made HHMI investigator in 2008, I believe, um, has received numerous awards. Um, I'm not going to list them all. Just I, I kind of went through, and I just got intimidated, so I'm going to give up. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, And I know Eric's work. Primarily through uh, through the Genome 10K project, which is a project to sequence 10,000 vertebrate genomes. Although that number keeps expanding, there's always inflation in genomes. Um, and Eric's work, particularly sort of connecting the convergent evolution of vocal learning, and uh, which Eric has kind of pioneered throughout his career and demonstrated recently uh, in multiple different birds, uh, and now thinking about it in uh, in primates and so forth. Um, and I'm sure he's going to tell us some of that today. Um, so it is a just a great pleasure and honor, and I, we should all uh, welcome Eric. Thanks. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction. I think this is also a mic for the uh, audio as well here, so I, I hope my voice projects well enough. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for that intro, as I just said, and as well as uh, David Hausler and others for inviting me here to be the first speaker for this program, and also for uh, generally about uh, what I'm going to talk about to the uh, group that's here today. That's whether they're in this program or not for the summer. And uh, so just a few cl points of clarification. Um, so yes, I actually wasn't actually um, re asked to uh, be on a scholarship, what he was talking about for uh, Alvin Ailey in New York City at the time, was actually I was asked to audition for their dance company. And I was trying to choose, OK, go to the Alvin Ailey dance company versus go to uh, graduate school, I mean, undergraduate school at that time to become a scientist. And I chose science. Uh, but I still dance. Uh, on and off and, and so forth and still perform a little bit but now instead of doing ballet as I did back then in Martin it's uh, uh, salsa dancing <laughs> and so uh, another clarification is that I accepted a position at the Rockefeller University but I haven't moved there yet but I will at some point later this fall um, <clears throat> so and uh, I look forward to doing you know even uh, greater things than what uh, I have done with my collaborators like Benedict and others since uh, in the past so today uh, I'm going to talk to you about science, but also the journey of how I got through where, where I got to where I am now from both a you know, humanistic perspective as a person who is interested in the sciences and the arts, as well as a person who is a non-represented minority, me myself being mostly African-American mixed up with a number of different things. And so what I'm going to do for the first two thirds of the talk is the science, and then, I, then the last third of the talk is uh, that personal journey and see how it influences the science that I and others I've collaborated with have done. So uh, about the science, my main passion in life is trying to understand how the brain produces and generates complex traits, uh, complex behaviors, that is. And the behavior that I've been most interested in is vocal learning because it, it is uh, the most critical behavioral substrate for spoken language. And I always thought if we can figure out a hard problem about how the brain works, uh, that might trickle down to figuring out how the brain works generally. And so uh, <clears throat> I broke this presentation down into three parts because uh, I think we need to understand what the brain really does. It produces behavior, in this case, vocal production learning, uh, the anatomy, the circuitry behind it, and then uh, focus a lot on the actual genes that 
I think are involved in uh, setting up the brain circuits and controlling their function. So vocal production learning is a pretty rare trait. It's only found in five groups of mammals, three groups of birds. So humans, it's, uh, as I said, this is what we use to produce uh, speech and language. Cetaceans, these are whales and dolphins, bats, elephants, and sea lions. And amongst <laughs> birds, there are th uh, so parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds. Many people know that parrots can imitate uh, sounds, including human speech in some cases. Um, there's all of these species or lineages have close relatives who don't imitate vocalizations, like chimpanzees uh, for humans or sub-Ossene uh, songbirds compared to Ossene songbirds. And so it's thought that all these uh, animal groups evolved this trait independently from a common ancestor. Now, uh, when we speak of spoken language and vocal learning, uh, for humans, our everyday experience, it comes as a, a package of traits. And part of that package uh, is, um, how can I say, is un unique to, uh, to these bird groups or in human, in mammal groups, some of it is different. And so I'm gonna, what is different, I mean what is not unique, is auditory learning. Uh, auditory learning is the ability to make sound associations uh, with new information in your environment. Many species have this ability. Uh, dogs can learn how to understand the word sit, siente se in Spanish and osuari in Japanese. Uh, these are not part of a dog's innate repertoire, even like whole sentences, get the ball, come here boy, and so forth, roll over. Uh, but a dog can, although it understands these human words and sentences through auditory learning, a dog can't actually learn how to say them, like, okay, you got it, I'll sit, all right? Or tell you to sit. Um, <laughs> I'm recognizing some familiar faces here, how you doing? So uh, uh, vocal learners can do this. Now conversely, there are traits that come along with the vocal, only vocal learners have that you can't find in dogs and other species. And, uh, they have certain disorders associated with them, only in vocal learners. So we depend upon auditory feedback not only to imitate the sounds, but to maintain those imitated sounds, such that when we become deaf, we have what's called deaf-induced vocal deterioration. The speech starts to deteriorate, unless you have some type of therapy. Um, <clears throat> we uh, pass on our vocal repertoires from one generation to the next, culturally leading to different dialects and different languages. Same things that happen in these songbirds as well, in dolphins. Uh, and this has disrupted uh, these, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that, that was the next thing. The point here is critical periods. Well, it's having cultural transmission. This has disrupted loss of, due to loss of social isolation. Here, um, <clears throat> our vocal learning behavior goes through critical periods uh, where we best learn early in life, before puberty, or before crystallization is what we say in these birds, and that kind of critical period behavior is disrupted in autism, uh, where is in non-vocal learning animal models of autism, you don't see much vocal communication deficits. So um, when I present this, some people say, well, the vocalizations that we do are much more complex than any of these other animals, and they can't be nowhere near us, and that is true to a certain degree. But even amongst these non-human vocal learners, there's some that are more complex than others, like the, the uh, Udriger here, which is a parakeet. And here's an example. What seems to be the problem, officer? I am not a cook. My name is Disco. I'm a parakeet. I'll play that again. It had a delay. <laughs> what seems to be the problem, officer? I am not a cook. My name is Disco. I'm a parakeet. Okay. So Disco has been raised with humans for about four years. Uh, and he's learned up to 400 words by that time. And uh, in here, you can see he's pr only, not only producing imitated human speech sounds, but producing whole sentences that have meaning to us. Uh, about 70% of the time, he seems to be ram rambling, shuffling words around, but there are many times where he actually produces them in context and recombines words into new meanings that have meaning to his owners. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, this is really remarkable uh, to me and to many other people. And so, hi David. So when you, uh, uh, don't want to announce he's getting in late now. So, <laughs> when, um, every once in a while, I, there's a publication that comes out about some non-human primate learning how to speak and people get excited about it. Uh, reporters call me up and here's one of the latest examples from 2015 of Coco, a gorilla who was raised with humans for 39 years. And uh, well, I'll just play it. How about when you're um, 
coughing. That was good. You did a sneeze and then a cough. Excellent. Now that's pretty interesting and good, but that's the best Coco can do. Okay, Coco can't say what seems to be the problem, officer. I'm a gorilla, or you know, not a crook, right? And uh, so, and what's going on here? Well, Coco, like uh, many other animals, has good auditory learning. Understand, understood these human speech sounds pretty quickly, and uh, voluntarily try to produce a, a a sound. In this case, coughing. But the coughing here is a sound that has a lot of respiratory air being pushed through the vocal tract without a lot of modulation through the larynx. Uh, the larynx in humans or the syrinx in birds is what's modulating all that sound. And so, uh, so there's voluntary control of exhalation and so forth, but not of the actual modulation of those sounds. Uh, most of the gorilla sounds are innate. And so uh, <clears throat> that's been leading us scientists, you know, banging our heads to trying to find out why can't we get our closest relatives to say something simple like apple, whereas one that's more, 300 million years distant from a common ancestor with us can even go further and say golden delicious, all right? And so, uh, so I, what I'm gonna get into is what is the difference in our brain and genes that we might share with these animals here but not with our closest relatives? And so I've come up with a hypothesis as to uh, there are some uh, uh, anatomical differences in how that came about. I call the motor theory of vocal learning origin and that's what I'm gonna explain next. And it kind of started with uh, trying to look for um, genes that are active in the brain when animals are singing or producing their learned song, in this case, canaries. We found that uh, when canaries sing their song, here's one example. Okay, so that's a canary song. Uh, it's learned, just like you heard that parrot speech before. And we found that when these birds produce their learned song, that is associated with rapid increases of immediate early genes, these are like CFOS or EGR1, genes that are sensitive to neural activity inside the neurons of these uh, brains. Uh, and the white signal here is the mRNA product for these genes. And, and it's these nuclei called HPC is responsible for producing the song. Area X and this one called L-man here is responsible for learning it. And uh, what you see here is a tissue slice of the brain the, as I said, the white signal is the mRNA, and the red is the crest of violet stain in the front of the brain in the back here. Here is an animal who is just walking around, uh, listening, and so forth, but you don't see, you see some expression in other brain regions, but not in these song learning nuclei in the forebrain. And we found that the more bird sings, uh, the higher increase of expression of this mRNA product you see inside these cells. Um, <clears throat> now, many people have been studying how these genes are regulated by activity as well as what are, what are their downstream consequences in chain, terms of changing synaptic plasticity and so forth. Uh, and my lab is doing that as well, the, studying the mechanisms of this. But we also use it as a behavioral molecular mapping tool to identify brain circuits that are active for particular behaviors. Uh, <clears throat> And in this case, it's a motor-driven gene expression response because it occurs even when the birds are deaf or when they are singing in the dark and so forth. Or you remove somatosensory input, you still get this motor-driven gene expression response. So we asked the question, uh, does anything like this happen in other species? And the answer is yes. And we've looked at various vocal learning species and non-vocal learners. And the take-home message here is that in all bird species we've looked at, you find what I've color-coded in blue here, an auditory pathway that shows hearing-induced gene activation or neural firing or processing when animals are listening to species-specific song that we think is involved in auditory learning, including in non-vocal learning species, all right? Whereas only the vocal learners, songbirds, hummingbirds, and parrots, had four brain regions that are active in the production of those vocalizations. Uh, whereas non-vocal learners had only brainstem regions that were active during vocalizations. And so, in gray here. And so, uh, in these three vocal learning bird groups, there are exactly seven such brain structures. All right? uh, three of them make up this pathway I said was involved in the imitation, and four of them in yellow here make up a pathway that's involved in producing those learned sounds. So this is quite remarkable. Either there are three independent gains of a similar circuitry over the last 30 to 60 million years, which is quite remarkable, or there were maybe one gain back here somewhere and four independent losses, 
Or maybe everybody has this circuitry to various degrees, and we can't find the one or 10 neurons here because it's so small. It's just independently amplified in these three groups. Um, another possibility I didn't even appreciate at the time when we made this discovery was maybe the tree is wrong, all right? Because uh, I'm not a phylogeneticist, at least I wasn't at the time. Uh, you know, I'm a neurobiologist, and maybe they got it wrong. I just trusted them. And maybe all, there's one common origin, and these three species are closely related to each other. Another possibility I personally didn't entertain, but this picture has made it into some uh, um, religious text to say that uh, this, how could this happen like this? It has to be intelligent design, all right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I haven't, you know, I didn't have an answer for that either at the time. So I asked, well, well, let's compare with humans. If birds can come up with a similar solution in the last 65 million years or so, what about we humans? Uh, uh, are we going to be any different? And so I began to make this comparison, and I, and I don't think the tree could be wrong in this case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, here is a zebra finch brain and a zebra finch brain to scale with a, a human. So a zebra finch is a songbird. And the first lesson you learn for this particular trait is brain size doesn't matter. All right. The second is all this cortical folding doesn't matter either to increase cortical surface area. I think the brain size difference in the cortical folding here have more to do with body size than um, uh, intelligence. And so I argue it's the presence or absence of a particular type of neural network that will make that difference for a complex trait. And, uh, <clears throat> but to get at that, what that neural network structure or compare humans to birds, we had to get rid of an old dogma that had been around for 100 years about understanding vertebrate brain organization. So back in the early, I mean, late 1800s, early 1900s, comparative neurobiologists, particularly Lew and Edinger and others, were taking Darwin's view of scale, and, I mean, Darwin's view of evolution, Aristotle's view of scale and natural, and even religion, and proposed that in they viewed evolution as in a linear fashion, unlike Darwin, and they argued that at the base of the human brain here, you can find what's called the paleostratum structure that they thought was present in fish. And then fish passed that on to amphibians, and you get this archistriatum here, and they pass that on to reptiles. You get this neostratum invention in reptiles, and birds, and finally invent something called the hyperstratum. And all these striatal names designated parts of the human basal ganglia, all right? And at that time, the human basal ganglia part of the brain was thought to be involved only in primitive behavior, which we now know, know it's no longer to be true. And that this green-labeled region here called the cortex, they called the neocortex, new because it was present only in mammals and can only find vestigial paleo archicortex in, in birds and other uh, non-mammalian vertebrates. And so, this view, oh, by the way, they even argued that this neocortex is bigger in Europeans compared to Asians and is bigger in Asians compared to Africans and then monkeys. Uh, so, and that's basically what was written in these early comparative neurobiology texts in the Journal of Comparative Neurobiology. That's where the, the logic of the term neocortex comes from. So um, I organized a consortium back in the early 2000s that reviewed all the evidence and generated more data and just said, this is completely wrong. All right, and this is what, based on the evidence, what we believe is that the avian brain and ma non vertebrate mammals, I mean, uh, non mammalian vertebrates in general, have a large cortical territory, just like uh, mammals do, except it's not layered, it's, it's organized as cell clusters. And here is the true basal ganglia here, all right? And further, <clears throat> when putting all this together, coming up with the Right hypothesis, the song learning nuclei are in these areas of the brain. So you have to get this right before you compare it to humans. All right? So now we think we got something right here. And making that comparison and pulling all the human and non-human primate literature together on speech and language, uh, I argued that uh, we humans have inherited a Wernicke's auditory cortex from a common ancestor with these birds from over 300 million years ago. And Wernicke's area involved in processing speech or complex sounds. And this is why I think dogs can understand sit, siente, say, come here, boy, get the newspaper, and so forth. But that we humans have independently evolved a uh, anterior forebrain circuit involving part of the cortex, the basal ganglia thalamus here, involved in learning how to speak, and a motor pathway involved in producing that learned speech that is functionally similar to these circuits here in song learning birds not homologous. 
Um, <clears throat> and I even propose different cell types uh, that might be uh, functionally similar. That is, this cell type here, HVC, called high vocal center, I propose is similar to layers two and three of the face motor cortex. RA similar to layer five neurons, which project out of the brain to the motor neurons that control the voice, and so on for some other areas. So, uh, by the way, this, this picture also went into some religious texts, you know, as intelligent design, because how could this happen like that, right? And so, I didn't really have an answer until an accidental discovery. Uh, I was helping some other colleagues use, I was using our molecular mapping tool to help them identify brain circuits involved in sensing magnetic fields in birds that migrate and use a magnetic compass. And we had to have a control group that was uh, doing lots of movement behavior. And, and that led to a study to show that all the song learning nuclei have brain areas that are active, also with gene expression, around those song nuclei when they're performing uh, complex movement behaviors, in this case, case hopping in a rotating wheel. Uh, and this is movement or motor-driven gene expression because it occurs independent of visual input, auditory input, somatosensory input. And uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is we find these movement circuit, which has similar connectivity, uh, around the song learning nuclei of all three vocal learning lineages. We also find this motor pathway in species that don't imitate songs. All right? You just don't find holes of expression there where the song nuclei would be. It's just the motor pathway without the song learning nuclei. All right? And so uh, putting all this together, ah, well, uh, one more thing. I, I have to do come back to something about my dance, talking about movement here. This led me to think maybe there's a relationship of the motor pathway to the song learning pathway, and that all species have equal abilities for motor learning behavior. All right, because they had this similar circuitry. But when I came up with this hypothesis at that time, uh, another study came out showing that only vocal learning species all right, have the ability to have synchronized learned movements to music. That is, they can dance to a beat. And here's an example. Hi, Snowball. Snowball so, is a parrot, I read it. a cockatoo. Is than dancing with the stars. Tell us very briefly what Snowball can do, and then we'll witness it for ourselves. Well, Snowball can dance to a beat, and he actually adjusts his dancing to fit the tempo of music. It's usually the downbeat of the music. He does this with visual simulation and auditory as well. <laughs> does, does he like for everybody to join in? Here we go. <laughs> And as Benedict was saying, here are some of the uh, scientists <laughs> trying to dance. Who, who's on target here or not? Okay. 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 So you can go on YouTube and watch the rest of that. So interestingly, many animals will respond to human music, but it seems like only vocal learning species can learn how to synchronize their body to the rhythm in the music, as opposed to just jumping around, hopping around in a sort of semi-random fashion. And so uh, uh, putting all this together is uh, how, do you, how, do you, how does that happen in a vocal learning species? Is it using these vocal learning circuits? Uh, in humans, uh, when we are uh, trying to perform choreographed learned dance movements and put a person in an imaging uh, instrument, what you'll see is the highest activation during these learned dance sequential movements occurs directly adjacent to the speech areas like uh, 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 is it back here is, uh, sorry, up here, back here would be laryngeal motor cortex and Broca's area involved in speech production and learning. So putting all this together, I've come up with what I call the motor theory of vocal learning origin, where I argue that all vertebrate species have an innate brainstem circuit producing innate vocalizations. They all have motor learning pathways controlling learning how to walk, learning how to fly, learning how to do many different motor behaviors, and that this pathway here consisting of two parts, a learning one and a production one, uh, I argue during embryonic development is replicated many times to get connected up to different motor neurons for controlling different muscles. All right? But I argue that in vocal learning species, in parrots and songbirds, this pathway has duplicated one more time, like gene duplication. I argue the entire brain pathway has duplicated. And that new duplicated pathway, I argue, gets hooked up to this innate brainstem circuit and takes it over to inform this 
vocal motor learning pathway that has similar connectivity as the surrounding circuit, right? Uh, and then I argue further that something about the genetic change that made this happen contaminated the surrounding immediate uh, motor pathway to be able to synchronize auditory input not only in the vocal pathway but in the surrounding motor pathway to allow them to learn how to synchronize their bodies to music. Right? So if all of this is true, uh, we would expect that the, at the molecular level, the genes that control and function this vocal learning circuit should be similar to the genes in the motor pathway around it. Okay? Uh, the genes in the motor pathway around it should be similar across all vertebrate species that have this motor learning pathway, vocal learners and non-learners. But there should be some differences. Uh, inside the vocal learning circuit, there are some differences in connectivity compared to the surround. For example, this RA nucleus makes a direct projection to motor neurons that control the vocalizations. Whenever you have direct cortical con connections to your motor neurons, it's always correlated with fine motor control you know, with the hands, fine dexterity or, or the vocal cords. Most of the uh, non-motor, non I mean non-vocal motor pathway has indirect connections. So we expect to find neural connectivity genes that might differ inside versus outside the sound circuit. And then finally, we expect some of these regions around the circuit in the vocal learner to have some genetic differences associated with synchronizing movements to sound for, for dancing, for example. So how are we going to prove all of that? Uh, that was a tough challenge, and uh, that leads me to this next part of my talk, is to use evolution and, and ask if the behavior and the anatomy are convergent, are the underlying genes convergent? Is there something that all these vocal learners share in these uh, uh, song learning brain regions? So one of the first genes we've looked at is called FOXP2. It's a gene when mutated in humans causes a speech deficit. It's a transcription factor that regulates the expression of other proteins. Who has heard of FOXP2 here? I thought, yeah, so many people have. So good, but um, <clears throat> uh, when uh, humans have a heterozygous mutation, they have good auditory learning but difficult speech learning. And here's an example. Huh? Okay. She's trying to say Laura, something Where cut out. Laura? She's trying to say Sheffield. And how old are you? She said four. Sorry, the beginning part of that cut off. So, but you can hear in her answers here that uh, she's having difficulty producing uh, speech appropriately. Her siblings of a similar age. Uh, or those that have the mutation versus those that don't, are the ones who don't actually speak much better than this as a four-year-old child. And you can see her auditory comprehension and learning is pretty well intact because she's answering these questions from the interviewer pretty quickly. And so that prompted us and a number of other people to study FOXP2 in songbirds. And we found that it is upregulated in the song learning nucleus area X of juvenile zebra finches when they're learning how to sing from an adult tutor. And then when it goes through its puberty crystallization phase, which only takes 90 to 120 days, as opposed to 13 years uh, in these birds, uh, the FOXP2 is downregulated in the song learning nucleus. And so that prompted a colleague of mine, Constance Scharf, to knock down FOXP2 with an RNAi molecule, uh, <coughs> turn off the protein here in area X, and ask, will these juveniles, like humans, have a deficit in learning how to imitate song? And here is an example. So what you see here are sonograms. These, this is not sonograms of the embryo, but sonograms of sound in the air. Uh, this is uh, time and the frequency here of the sounds. Here is a zebra finch song, and this is a tutor, adult tutor. OK, here is a 2T with another gene, control gene knocked down, a sister gene, but not FOXP2. So this is what's supposed to happen. OK, that's normal imitation. All right. Here is another tutor. Adult. Okay, and here is the animal that he tutored, but now this one had FOXP2 knocked down. I think you can hear the difference here. He's not accurately copying the song. All right, and so um, this shows that, like in humans, this gene is necessary for accurate vocal imitation, not necessary for actually producing sounds, uh, but to produce them correctly.
And so uh, this is quite remarkable. And this pr now this stimulated many labs to study this gene in songbirds as a model for human speech. And so there seems to be convergent use. But uh, me, myself personally, I wasn't satisfied with stopping at this gene uh, in trying to understand uh, the mechanisms of how this circuit develops because um, it is re developmentally regulated post formation of the song learning system. And it's only really expressed in one of the seven song learning nuclei. So I thought there must be some other genes that are really setting up this circuit uh, from the surrounding motor pathway. So that prompted me to also take not only an educated guess approach, but a black box approach to this question and get in involved in genomics, scan the genomes. Uh, and I got involved in sequencing the genome of one songbird, a zebra finch, uh, and one parrot, uh, when I became a Hughes investigator, investigated my funds with next generation technology uh, in sequencing a uh, parakeet genome. And my lab and many other labs got a lot of use out of these genomes uh, in some of these publications here. But you begin to really rat, uh, learn quickly, especially from a statistical point of view, that an N of two vocal learners and one non-learner sequence at the time, a chicken, uh, is not good enough uh, for comparative genomics or statistical analysis, period. Further, the chicken uh, is as far removed from songbirds and parrots as marsupials are to uh, uh, placental mammals or humans. Uh, you need a, more, a closer relative. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, around this time when uh, we were sequencing the parrot genome, then uh, I got involved in what's a group called the Genome 10K Consortium. Uh, David and others invited me to that group, whose mission it was to sequence the genomes of 10,000 vertebrate species. And that was really making me happy, because I was going to make sure we get all the vocal learners and their close relatives. But this was, this was an idea at the time, and the consortium didn't uh, really have the funds to do it. But uh, BGI came in and stepped in. This is a Beijing Genome Institute in China, and said, we will contribute funds to sequence the one, first 100 vertebrate genomes for you. And so uh, uh, I teamed up with Goji Zhang, who is director of plant and animal genomes at BGI, along with his collaborator, Tom Gilbert, uh, who is involved in ancient genome sequencing. And uh, the bird part of this consortium kind of took off more uh, because they, too, like me, were interested in whether the tree was right, all right? Uh, because they, as many other people, were using birds to study evolution of specific traits. And you need to have the tree right to understand uh, the particular trait. So we formed what's called the Phylogenomics Consortium, but still part of this G10K initiative. And uh, we convinced the leadership at BGI, and as well as pulled resources from other labs together, and uh, sequenced 45 new bird genomes which was a remarkable feat at that time, back in 2010, I think it was starting, and uh, <clears throat> 2010 to 2011. And we, I made sure we had multiple vocal learning species there, like the Darwin's finch and a crow for songbirds, several parrots, a hummingbird, and their close relatives according uh, to different publications. So it, it was the case that, for example, one year, one publication uh, in 2008 said that falcons are the closest relative of parrots. Another in 2009 said, no, it's owls are the closest relative of parrots. Who is it? And so what we did is we just sequenced the genomes of all species that were the closest relative of vocal learners according to the different um, uh, publications out there. So we ended up sequencing one species per order plus multiple species uh, who are considered closest relatives of vocal learners. And um, <clears throat> you can imagine with all these genomes, we needed a lot of help. But a lot of people came flocking to us as well who wanted to uh, use these genomes to study their particular questions. And so at the end of a four-year period, we ended up having over 200 researchers from 110 institutions here, including UC Santa Cruz, all right, and uh, from 20 different uh, countries. And <clears throat> we told away at the data for a four-year period, no algorithm that worked on a smaller data sets could work on these larger data sets. We had to uh, develop, enhance new computational tools and so forth. And, uh, and in that time period, we actually ended up pr uh, producing from 2014 to 2016 now over 50 published papers from this effort, of which 28 of those were published on a single day at the end of 2014, uh, eight of those 28 in a specialist year of science magazine, and several more later. Uh, and <clears throat> Uh, talking about various different uh, traits or even the methods of genomics. 
And uh, I don't want to take credit for all of this uh, because there are a number of folks in, in, in this audience, like David and others, who were involved in this effort. And so in red, I color-coded those in which my uh, group uh, led or co-led with others. In uh, blue are papers that uh, we collaborated on. And in red are papers which uh, are benefited from having the genomes that we gave people access to, although I didn't necessarily contribute to those studies intellectually. And so um, <clears throat> focusing on the question at hand for this talk, I, we asked, one of the biggest questions we really asked first, was the tree wrong or right? And uh, the idea here is that lots of trees in the past were based upon either morphology or individual genes. And gene trees could be different from the species tree due to complex things like what's called lineage sorting or incomplete lineage sorting, where the gene has a different history from the species. So we try to create what we call a genome scale tree. And the closer you make a tree that matches the whole genome, the more likely it's, it's going to represent the true species tree. And here on your left is the first genome scale tree after toiling away with many different algorithms. At high resolution for the first time on many branches for, the, for all these birds here. If you don't have a number here, it means 100% support. Here is a tree that I've been using for 15 years all right, to understand evolution of vocal learning. Mm -hmm. It's based mostly upon morphology. And you can see all the rearrangements of the species in this tree here. Uh, everything's changing, basically. What about my, uh, oh, by the way, this tree, we don't think, is a tree that has no biological basis to it because we found that of the, uh, uh, within the genome, we can take out certain proteins that are rapidly evolving and infer their particular tree uh, structure, and they match this tree more than the actual genome scale tree. Whereas the introns of those same rapidly evolving protein coding sequences match the species tree, all right? So uh, what about vocal learners? Here, these vocal learners are more closer together. So either three independent gains or, or one gain followed by multiple losses, where here it pulls hummingbirds much further away from uh, songbirds and parrots here. So you have either th two, three independent gains or two gains followed by two losses, which would be quite remarkable. It's like saying humans and chimps had a common ancestor with speech and chimpanzees lost it, uh, uh, which would be this equivalent up here. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting about this tree is that water birds come together, whereas they're separate here. I call this a convergence tree. And I think it has some real biological meaning to it uh, that needs further study. So. Uh, <clears throat> Now that we have these genomes and we have a tree that does say vocal learners evolved independently, uh, although not there in even a bigger way than we thought before, uh, now we can ask the question and use these genomes to compare genes expressed in the brain across species. Um, now, I'm going to come back to my hypothesis here, but mine wasn't the only one around about compar comparative similarities between humans and songbirds. So I argued that the RA song nucleus that makes this projection out of the forebrain is similar to layer five neurons of laryngeal motor cortex that project out of the forebrain. But others said, no, it's similar to the cingulate cortex or the amygdala. I argued that this HVC song nucleus involved in producing song is similar to layers two and three cell type neurons here in the laryngeal motor cortex. Others said Broca's area or Wernicke's area. Uh, I argued that area X is similar to a part of the human anterior striatum that is most active during speech production, others said nucleus accumbens involved in emotional components of speech. And so uh, nobody, sorry, nobody's arguing that any of these regions here in these publications are similar to uh, circuits in the chickens or macaques or non-vocal learning uh, mammals and birds. So who's right? With these genomes, now I think we can answer this question, and this is how we uh, try to do that. Um, what we did is laser dissect out the song learning nuclei under a microscope uh, and pop them up to Eppendorf caps here of each of the vocal learning lineages and isolated their RNA and profiled them to microarrays. Uh, we also did the same thing to the surrounding brain areas in the vocal learners and non-vocal learning motor areas where we would expect to find the song learning nuclei and profile them to microarrays. Fortunately for us, the Allen Brain Institute was doing something similar for human bra brains post-mortem, of course. Uh, people then donated their organs to science where they dissected out 3,700 samples from the cortex, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, the spinal cord uh, from six people, and several hundred samples from uh, macaques, including different layers of the cortex, and profiled them to microarrays. And uh, students and postdocs from my lab 
then analyzed the data. Andreas Fenning, he did the computational work. He's now got a job at uh, Carnegie Mellon as an assistant professor there. Irina Hara, who's at Janelia Farms, Howard Hughes, and Osceola Whitney, who's about to go to um, uh, uh, City University for a, a professorship position there. They did the wet lab work. And what we did is ask, can we find similar gene expression specializations or profiles in these song learning nuclei to anything else in the human brain, anywhere in the human brain? All right? And what Andreas and, and they found is that using the genome alignments of the genes expressed in the brains of these species, uh, we could find 7,000 genes that are, are shared or expressed in the brains of birds and humans, okay? That we are confident about their orthology um, in, in, uh, in syntenic alignments. And uh, what we had to do is compare the expression level of these 7,000 genes in several thousand brain regions. That's really hard. So how do we come up with a solution to do that? What we did is develop an algorithm that forms a gene expression tree of one species and a gene expression tree of another species, and then we compare the two trees, where each node in the tree is an expression vector, okay, that has 7,000 values for the expression level of all 7,000 genes in that particular brain region or particular node. Um, <clears throat> even if it's zero. Each branch in the tree is a difference vector of expression of the all 7,000 genes in one node minus all 7,000 genes in another node. And then we try to correlate every single node in this tree with every single node in that tree and get a correlation value. And then take those three values that I just told you about and use a dynamic programming algorithm that tries to find the most optimal alignment between this gene expression tree and that gene expression tree between species. And as is a statistically significant alignment. And we were able to find optimal alignments that matched our new understanding of vertebrate brain organization. So we think we got that right, and the folks from 100 years ago did get it wrong. Where the node called telencephalon, or the forebrain in humans, matched the node that's telencephalon in birds. Same thing for the basal ganglia, same thing for brainstem circuits. What about the song learning nuclei? The RA saw nucleus of all brain regions that it could match the thousands of brain regions that it could share gene expression profile with in the human brain, it had the most significant correlation with the human laryngeal motor cortex uh, in humans and did not match uh, for those set of genes anything in the non-human primate brain. All right? It was specific to human laryngeal motor cortex. And when that happened, I jumped up and down for joy because that is quite remarkable. I mean, this was an unbiased uh, screen of, screening of genes. Uh, and it matched layer five neurons in particular for, uh, for a set of genes in the uh, motor cortex, supporting that hypothesis. And it did not match the amygdala here. Had, in fact, it had an anti-correlation of gene expression with the amygdala, so rejecting that hypothesis. HPC was similar to layers two and three of the uh, motor cortex and not the claustrum uh, around the striatum here. L-man had a weak match to Broca's area. Uh, and uh, area X had a match to the part of the anterior human striatum, not quite where it predicted it, but a little bit more posterior. And so uh, what's interesting is that this location here was predictive for another colleague of mine to now go look at that area, put people in the scanner, and ask what happens to that part of the human striatum, and found that that is the most active area of the human striatum when we're actively learning how to imitate human speech. Uh, so it was a nice prediction from our work here. Uh, <clears throat> So now we have, uh, and it did not match the accumbens, by the way. So we now have behavioral convergence associated with anatomical convergence associated with molecular convergence. But how many genes? One, five or so out of these 7,000s are bringing these regions together? It's tens of genes, all right? And here is one example, the RA region, human laryngeal motor cortex. This is a heat map. Each column here is a sample from a particular species. Each row here is one gene of 55 genes in total. And we can see that the expression profile of the uh, RA song nuclei of songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds is more similar to the human laryngeal motor cortex that controls the larynx than it is to the motor areas adjacent to it in non-vocal learning species or other cortical areas in humans or other cortical areas in non-human primates. Uh, and many of these genes, uh, designated in blue here are downregulated compared to the surrounding cortical areas, and they're, they're enriched in axon guidance function, uh, these particular genes here, like slit one. Uh, <clears throat> the ones that are upregulated, or like parvabumin here, are, tend to be involved in neuroprotection functions. So the, the neural connectivity genes make sense to me because 
these circuits differ in neural connectivity from the surrounding motor areas. But the neural protection genes, they didn't make sense to me until I realized you know, these neurons here that control vocal production actually fire a lot. Okay? They have high firing rates compared to the surrounding motor circuits. And us vocal learners, whether we be humans or songbirds, we like to vocalize, talk a lot, compared to our close relatives who don't have vocal learning. And so I thought maybe these genes are protecting our neurons so we can talk a lot once we evolve this trait. Uh, that's a hand-waving hypothesis that needs some testing now. Uh, microarrays are subject to false positives, so we uh, validated some of these by in situ organizations, and to give you a slip one as an example, we proved that it, it is down-regulated in the RE song learning nucleus of all three vocal learning bird lineages, not anywhere in this similar cell type in the uh, quail or dove brain non-vocal learners. Also downregulated in two areas of the human primary motor cortex, this more classic ventral laryngeal motor cortex region and this more dorsal region that um, was argued by the imaging folks to be the true laryngeal motor cortex. Uh, but we actually ar argue that they're both right. We think we have two laryngeal motor cortex regions. Actually, even in parrots, we're finding two regions. And that led us to another study where we argue that there is this ancient motor learning pathway, taking my motor learning hypothesis of the motor theory of vocal learning origins, that is, this even one step further, what we call brain evolution by brain pathway duplication. We have this ancient motor learning pathway in all species. You get one duplication of the pathway forming a vocal learning circuit in red here. And then in humans and in parrots, we think you get another duplication in yellow here, uh, forming a, a, a song system surrounding the old song system. All right? And these uh, additional song system in parrots is bigger in species that have greater abilities to imitate human speech compared to those that don't. And further, in the surrounding motor areas, these light green regions here, we find, in, especially in parrots, um, have even more specialized expression of genes that you don't find in the non-vocal learning species, motor circuits. Meaning, we think that these specialized genes in the surrounding motor areas might be controlling their ability for dancing, all right, coming full circle here. And so uh, we're looking towards uh, trying to investigate that in the future, and, what, and how in the world are you getting what looks like whole pathway duplications? Are gene duplications responsible for brain pathway duplications, for example? And is there is some kind of genetic change inside the song learning circuit contaminating surrounding motor areas to allow them to synchronize their bodies to rhythm? Yes? Uh, so this many senses of the word duplication here. I'm getting the impression that there actually are more cells mm -hmm. than there were before, that, that the pathways are Bigger. And, and, and that there are genes that are literally duplicated. But, but so which, I mean, when, when, I, when I see the yellow there, yeah. am I to imagine that there are now more cells? That what, where there was I, cells I, in an ancient species, now there are two cells that are specialized. I didn't have the answer as to are you gaining something by losing something? Because to, you, if you're going to put more cells there and not make a bigger brain, right. uh, then you've got to uh, uh, somehow lose something. But uh, it turns out, just published in PNAS by a colleague of mine, Tukumsa Fitch, that vocal learning species have more neurons per volume of brain than the non-vocal learning species. And birds in general even have more cells packed in there. So I think you are getting more cells. And I think it is a different set of more cells. It's not just more cells are the same, because the connectivity inside so the red pathway here, the, what I consider the more ancient vocal learning circuit, has different connectivity from the new evolved one. This new evolved one, and I, I'm going to say new evolved, it still has to be proved, doesn't actually project out of the forebrain. It projects into uh, the, the red circuit, which then projects out of the forebrain. And, and, and so part of what makes the new cells different could then be deeper pathway duplications or gene duplications. That's right. That's right. That's right. So they mirror each other. I think so. I think so. Right. And we're looking towards Hox genes as a possible candidate. Uh, that, that might make that difference. So, so, yeah, some interesting things just by sequencing a bunch of genomes leads you to this, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> so these genes, you, if they're really involved in setting up these circuits, you expect them to change developmentally, and that's exactly what we find when we look. Uh, the SLIT1 or ligand, uh, it's actually developmentally down-regulated in the RE song learning nucleus. 
Uh, it's receptor Rova1, another gene when mutated has some speech associated deficits to it, by the way. It is transiently upregulated in this RSO nucleus and then turns off during the after the critical period is over. Females of this particular species, zebra finch, don't learn how to imitate songs. They don't show this developmental change in these genes, uh, in their rudimentary uh, so, uh, nucleus here. Uh, <clears throat> so what's going on? Why turn down these genes? Uh, well, it turns out that many of these axon guidance molecules that we see turned off are repulsive in their functions. So Mark Tesla Levine's group has shown that when slit one binds its, its receptor Roba one, it repels those axons from forming a connection to the cell bodies here. So we think these layer five neurons of the non-vocal learning motor circuits, when they are developing, they'll synapse onto the surrounding reticular formation neurons because they're being repelled from the actual motor neurons themselves, whereas in the human and songbird speech and song circuits, slit one, for whatever reason, is turned off in those cells, and we think that allows this direct connection to form and to have the forebrain have more direct control over your muscles uh, than some type of intermediary here. And so uh, going forward in the future, this is what we'd like to test and prove. Uh, how would you do that? We would try to, let's say, upregulate slit one and other genes in our array to see if we make a direct projection indirect and in hamper the ability of vocal learning. Take a non-vocal learning species and try to downregulate it and see if we can make a direct projection, I mean an indirect one direct, and maybe even take over an existing motor learning pathway so we don't have to try to duplicate it, all right, and get it to uh, now move the accents just a few motor neurons over onto the uh, uh, vocal motor neurons and get this animal to imitate, all right? We'd like to try that with humans as well and ma manipulate that, but in their, our own brains, that's hard, but we can try to do this with a mouse. And at the time we were doing all these, this work, we knew one day we would want to try to do some kind of manipulation in mice, but no one knew about vocal circuits in mice, or even whether they're vocal learners or not, it was assumed they're non-vocal learners. Then a colleague of mine, Tim Holly, came out with a study showing that mice produce these ultrasonic, what he calls songs, that sound like this. All right, sounds like a songbird almost. Here's a male, he, males uh, sing this and they chase females. This is pitched down to our hearing range. And the females like it actually when they produce more complex syllable types. Uh, and uh, it turns out that actually it is mostly innate. It's not learned. Uh, they can modulate a little bit their pitch. Uh, so it's not complete, completely, totally, totally innate. And we found using neural tracing studies, actually they do have four brain circuit layer five neurons that make a projection down to brainstem motor neurons, but very, very sparse projection, like one to three axons per motor neuron as opposed to humans and sombers where it's hundreds, okay? So this led us to think that actually even, you know, kind of reevaluate some of those things I told you, that maybe this could have happened by brain pathway duplication and it's forming a pathway now where in some species we don't see it at all, uh, and that instead of, uh, Oh yes, I'm, sorry, I'm going to say in a minute. Instead of trying to enhance the circuit, I mean uh, induce the circuit, maybe we can downregulate these genes, like in the songbird brain here, to enhance a connection. Yes, go ahead. Just real quick, the, mm -hmm. the, the mice that have the human version of FOXP2, mm -hmm. do they, like, they alter the? Frequency? That that's what we're looking at now. They don't know the answer to that. Okay. We're looking at that now. But we've now, we have looked at mice that have the human mutation of FOXP2. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, so and that's the, on this next slide okay, here. Okay. All right, ahead of me. Okay. and and we find that these mice that have the human mutation sing less in contacts that involve females, and particularly in contacts where the wild type sings more complex syllable types, the FOXP2 mutant mice don't. They have a hard time switching to syntax that's more complex. All right, uh, and that is this what we call a multiple jump pitch syllable type. Uh, they're not switching, the FOXP2 mutant mice aren't switching to that as often. And humans with these mutations have a difficulty switching to syllables that are more complex type of syllables, making speech sound more muddled, All right? So, so it's, it has an effect on mice that we think is similar to humans, it's just not as dramatic, All right? Uh, and this is a, a, just a, a result showing you that if you play this more complex song compared to this more simple song like the Fox B2 mice are singing, uh, the females prefer this more complex ones. So we think it does have some kind of consequence in terms of social communication, sexual selection. So this might make our job easier instead of trying to um, 
induce a circuit, as I say, enhance a pre-existing circuit. And this is what we're trying, and I'll just finish off with the last few slides and get into uh, the last part of the talk I, I wanted to I mention. We've been able to overexpress FOXP2, human FOXP2, in the songbird RA, make it more like a non-vocal learner pattern, and we do see the songs start to deteriorate. That is, the syllable uh, syntax, not syntax, its syllable acoustic structure is not as stereotyped. So like in deafening, the song is starting to deteriorate. So this gene, even the adult animal, is necessary to be downregulated to maintain learned song. All right? What about mice? Using an RNAi molecule, we'll be enabled to downregulate it in this laryngeal motor cortex region hooked up to a GFP molecule here. We don't change the repertoire composition, but these mice do sing less. Uh, I was hoping they would sing more. Uh, and uh, we didn't see syntactical changes in adults, but in juveniles where we uh, manipulated, I don't have the results because it just happened last week, my graduate student got it last week, there is a slight syntax deficit uh, in reduction of these simple, I mean, more complex syllable types. So, um, <clears throat> so in, I, all this has led up to me asking, I think we're getting closer to figuring out why this animal can't say apple and we can. I think we're further away from it, but I never believed in my lifetime we would have all these genomes and more to come, and the ability to go with our dreams to try to manipulate these circuits in species to try to get some other animal more closer to us in terms of trying to imitate sounds. Uh, so I'm looking for students and postdocs and so forth to help us on this journey for those who are interested. So um, I, I did say I was going to talk about a journey. I'm going to talk about it. I was trying to leave 10 minutes for that. Just bear with me for another five minutes, uh, five to seven minutes, to tell you about my own personal life and how that has influenced uh, the kind of science that I just talked about now. Uh, and so uh, I've been asked questions about you know, when I get some type of publicity and so forth, people call me up or reporters call me up, how did I do it? And I say, how did I do what? Right? And, well, how did you, a person born in Harlem, New York City, underrepresented minority, do what you did? Right? I says, I didn't know, even know I couldn't do it. And so I recently won an award and I wrote an article uh, tr trying to say, how did I do it, that I titled Surviving as an Underrepresented Minority Scientist in a Majority Environment and some of the lessons I've learned that I was once naive about that I feel like I know more about. So just to give you a little bit of history here, yes, I did start out as an artist, as a dancer. I went to high school of performing arts in New York, as Benedict mentioned, as uh, majoring in dance. Uh, when I graduated, um, <clears throat> I decided to become a scientist because I thought as a scientist I could do something that has a higher impact on society than I could as a dancer. My mother was trying to raise us to do something that has a good impact on society. And so I went to Hunter College in this part of Sydney University in New York, got into what we, they called affirmative action programs at the time, MBRS and uh, Mark, uh, and that allowed me to do research in a laboratory at Hunter. I stayed in the same lab for four years of my undergraduate training, the lab of Rifka Rudner doing um, uh, bacterial molecular work, and took my dance training and passion and applied it to science, really worked hard, uh, tried to work efficiently, and I got seven papers out of that as an undergraduate, but I'm, not a, I'm, a, I'm a first author on two of those seven, so I didn't want the undergraduates here to think that uh, you know, somehow I magically produced seven co -author, first author papers as an undergraduate. Some of those were published after I graduated, but I helped finish up. Um, with that, actually it was interesting, with those pa even with several publications at the time, and being an underrepresented minority, it's kind of made me a commodity uh, to try to get into graduate school. They were asking, please come here. And it's because they were wondering, how did I do that? Especially as an underrepresented minority at the time. Uh, so I got into graduate school. I stayed as an under a graduate student for six and a half years. I actually struggled as a graduate student a lot. It was a tough road. I went from a school where they held your hand a lot to Rockefeller University where it was sink or swim. Uh, and I, I sank for the first few years. Uh, and, and some people even thought, I remember, felt I was there for a quota, and that also I internalized. Uh, but in the end, I really, uh, really pushed hard in the, in the last few years, persevered, and stayed on uh, in the same lab. I didn't want to listen to the rules because things were working towards the end of my PhD. And so I stayed in Fernando Nadebaum's lab as a postdoc and uh, published nine papers in that whole time period in nine years for my graduate work and postdoctoral work. And with that, I was able to land a decent assistant professor job at Duke University. Uh, and in my first six years the year uh, before getting tenure, uh, published 17 papers. I, I don't like uh, boasting on the numbers here, but it does have a, a measure of productivity uh, to tell you what rules that I used to get this far uh, at that time and now. 
And then some people say this took too long. I, uh, after six years, it became 10 years. But it was only after 10 years I became full professor. Uh, and at that time, we published 80 papers, of which uh, 30 or so are part of that 2014 uh, initiative. Okay, so so there was a b recent big jump here. Okay, all right. Again, I, and I show you the color coding of which ones my lab led and didn't. Uh, and I just became a full professor last year, and uh, you know, and still publishing, fortunately. And so, um, <clears throat> so going from science to dance, I mean, dance to science. What I find is being trained as an artist is training you as a scientist because uh, there are lots of similarities. Uh, and I talked about in this article that the Smithsonian interviewed me for. This is a high school picture, by the way. I, I, was, I was chosen as the, the Arabian guy in the Nutcracker, OK? And you can imagine why. All right, so, um, and uh, yeah, that's when I was with the Westchester Ballet Company. And so um, I find that the discipline that we've learned as, as an artist learning how to try and try again before, uh, and having lots of failure before success trained me for science. Being creative, uh, learning this is not a nine to five job, all right? that you have to fall in love with your work. You have to go at it with a passion in order to really love and survive and do well in this career. And all of that was I, I got trained as a dancer. And so I encourage folks who have some type of artistic background or something that was their passion early in life that wasn't science, you can take that with you into becoming a scientist because I think it'll help a lot. And so then when I became a scientist, at, at, uh, that's when I first joined uh, Rockefeller, I mean Duke, you can see I was younger then. Um, <clears throat> and so, oh, uh, this is what I just said. So I put, now put in quotes that the transition between uh, so dance and science is natural as both require discipline, creativity, hard work, often acceptance of failure before something works. All right, and so uh, I also had role models, and they're not, not necessarily scientists. Or in one case, my one of my role models was my grandfather uh, uh, here, who was a guy who uh, tried to uh, pr um, emulate excellence, being uh, dignified, honor, and so forth. Uh, in contrast, my father wasn't a role model. He uh, was a drug addict. Uh, he became homeless. He was actually trying to become a scientist himself back in the 1960s and then dropped out of college in the whole 1960s revolution and so forth. Even though I, I considered him kind of a friend, I couldn't see him as a role model. Uh, so my grandfather really was my first role model. My second role model that, that I really emulated a lot was Rivka Rudner, who was my, she calls her, herself my science, uh, Jewish mom, okay, this was my undergraduate advisor, all right, and uh, who basically took my hand and helped me uh, get through uh, research in the laboratory. And so um, and I took advantage of those role models and putting all this together, I don't have a lot of time to, to talk about all this, so I just want to give some highlights here. What I consider equation of success in sciences in many fields is that you have to have hard work plus talent plus an opportunity equals success. When one of these three are missing from this equation, it's hard to have success. All right, so you are more in control of your hard work and talents, all right? Uh, but you're less control of opportunities. Uh, some of programs like this one for the students that are supporting it and other programs that uh, other students and faculty are benefiting from, those are the opportunities. And what many people don't realize is that they don't take advantage of those opportunities, all right? And so, what I encourage the students for this summer is to really take advantage of it, utilize it. Don't wait for somebody to come to you. Go to your faculty members, go to your student peers, ask them questions. Uh, why isn't something working? And you have to be the one who has to be proactive at doing that, and then you'll have success. Uh, <clears throat> and learn how to do hard work, but also learn how to relax a little bit. So I still go out and dance. I still perform now. I started performing, my kids are older, and so I, I'm doing salsa performances now. So, I encourage you to have a balance in life as well, but hard, do hard work. Uh, and so I just said that. So <clears throat> what opportunities have been there for me that made me realize some things that I had to learn about? One is affirmative action programs. So I was wondering, are these programs, you know, as we have in this country, some people say they're unfair, or, or diversity programs and so forth. And I started thinking, am I getting something that unfairly that other people don't have an advantage for or don't, don't get that advantage. And uh, <clears throat> one thing that hit me to say that this is not the case because when I, as I said, was applying to graduate school and I had these publications and it, I became a commodity, I felt like. Also, when I was going for my um, faculty positions, it was similar. And uh, 
when I applied to Duke, Duke said to, and it was competing with other universities, Duke said to me, if you are here for five years or longer as a faculty member, then you get what's called a tuition benefit program for your children, right? Such that when they go to college, Duke will pay 100% of their tuition if they go to Duke, or 75% of Duke's tuition level if they go anywhere else in the world. And I was like, really? Such a program exists? I couldn't believe it. And not only could I believe it, because back in the 1960s, my father, my parents, nobody from my family could go to Duke University because they didn't allow people of color to be students at that time. All right? So I could have not benefited from such a program from Duke University. Uh, and I realized that uh, a whole population of people who could go to Duke University and some other universities that had discrimination at the time were benefiting from an affirmative action program for Caucasian Americans. All right, for decades. Um, and so that just, when I heard that, that washed away generations of oppression. That my children, I had, and I have two children, could go to college with their t tuition paid for by this affirmative action program from Duke. All right, uh, for me being a faculty member there. And so I realized these programs, they actually are advantages for people that offset disadvantages that many of us don't realize we have, or many of us don't even realize that somebody else has. Um, <clears throat> And so you take advantage of them. Another thing I had to learn, uh, this is the last thing I'll talk about, uh, no, maybe there is one more thing, is about being collaborative versus individualistic. I grew up in what I call a Martin Luther King family, uh, and you know, where you, sh you know, try to include everybody, include you know, all races, all ethnicities, and so forth, into your sphere. Our, um, <clears throat> and because of that, I've taken a more collaborative approach to science, I think, than many other people as David might attest to. Uh, and I haven't taken this individualistic approach as much, the westernized approach that I consider. And that has led to uh, people you know, saying to me as I've been trained along the, Eric, you're not first author or last author in enough papers. That's going to hurt your career. Or you're not independent of your former advisor. You shouldn't stay in the same lab for your PhD. Uh, which I, so I broke that rule. I broke that rule. Or uh, so you do your graduate and postdoc at different places, broke that rule. Play the law in sciences, prove your independence. I broke that rule as well. All right? My rule is what are people going to remember me for by the time I die? What impact am I going to have on society? If that requires being individualistic for a certain set of experiments, I'll do it. If it requires collaboration, I'll do it. All right? And I take these lessons learned from what I've learned from my upbringing in the civil rights era. All right? and, so, uh, and that's what I encourage you to think as well. What is going to work? And so I do the same thing in my lab where uh, I have a lab that has diverse groups of people. Somehow they get attracted to my lab as well, which brings lots of cultural experience and different ways of thinking. Same thing for the actual scientific research where we uh, attack a particular question from multiple angles. I should go ahead and add genomics here. Um, and yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's not quite covered by molecular biology. And also, even my own ethnicity, this is the last point I'm going to get to. Even in my own family, we had to struggle. Now, you can look at me. I'm phenotypically, yes, colored, um, but not quite African, right? And so uh, in my own family, we've been arguing since I've been a child, what are we? People always say, oh, you're denying your blackness, or you're denying your European ancestry or Native American ancestry. And this is what I've been told oral history-wise. And as a scientist and, and a historian to a certain degree, I said, OK, I'm going to prove for the family and even for other families surrounding mine, what are we? Right? And so actually, I, I did 23andMe, but I sequenced uh, mitochondria from my own uh, I, a hair sample when I was a postdoc before 23andMe and things were available. And, uh, and my, haplo my mitochondrial haplotypes matched some African-American women. So I said, that wasn't helpful, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so more recently, yes, you, can, you have these uh, uh, companies that have these SNP arrays that can track ancestry. And um, what I get with Ancestry.com, for example, is seven different African groups, seven different European groups in my genome, all right? And, uh, and they're scattered throughout the genome here. So these are the 23 chromosomes. And blue is European ancestry. Red or, or brown, dark red is African. And uh, yellow is uh, uh, Native American. And so the Native American is much smaller than I was expecting, but it's all scattered up. My whole family has been mixed up for generations. And actually, I'm 0.1% more European than African, OK, <laughs> according to this. <laughs> but. Uh, but these things could be subject to some error as well. So, right, yes, yeah. 
because um, I got my whole genome sequence by David Goldstein's group at, when they were at Rockefeller, and I sent the genome to Carlos Bustamante's group in uh, 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 Stanford, and they analyzed my genome, and uh, I got an email from them I, this day I woke up 77% European, right? I said, this can't be true. And so I'm sending all the pictures of all the dark people in my family to them. It says, look at these guys. You think this, can't, this just can't be true. It says, oh, we used the wrong database as a reference. We got to use an admixture database for you. I mean, look at it, right? And so, um, <clears throat> and uh, it turns out it, it, it matched some of these numbers here. So who am I supposed to be representing when I come give a diversity talk? Europeans or Africans? or Native Americans or somebody else, right? I say I represent the world. Uh, just to put it in context, here is the, what the genome of a person in sub-Saharan Africa looks like. There's less the genetic diversity within populations within Africa than in African Americans. Same thing for Europeans, all right? Uh, so <clears throat> uh, putting it all in perspective, this is the perception of me growing up, mostly African, a little bit of Native American, European. This is what my oral history tells me, uh, mostly African, then European, then some Native American. And this is what the genetics say, all right? And so I'm working with uh, Ed Green here uh, and Beth Shapiro and with some students here to test if this is really true, all right? We were sequencing uh, DNA from ancient bone samples of, of Native Americans to see if you're going to find any SNPs in my genome and some other people, see if this Native American gets bigger, or is this a... Um, is this uh, some kind of oral history? 85% of African Americans say they have Native American ancestry, right? So one hypothesis, it's true. The other hypothesis is that uh, it's all really coming from white rape of white slave owners, and they're, uh, through shame, they're denying their white ancestry by saying it's Native American, which would, which would be, say, a whole population is delusional. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. And so, all right, <clears throat> so last slide here is to, uh, uh, summarizing all of this up, is that, uh, I think being trained to persevere in the face of daunting obstacles is necessary. Overcoming the feeling of less than uh, in terms of being an underrepresented minority, the only way I overcame that kind of feeling was by publishing, okay? And uh, I encourage uh, other students to do the same. Uh, I find that the skin color or your gender is really a, a, a neutral. It's either a disadvantage or an advantage. I've taken the road saying, I just wanna be the best role model that I can be be the best scientist I can be, uh, and be careful about getting involved in, in being an activist because it will take a lot of time from doing your science. And that, I think, will change people's perceptions. Uh, I tend to feel that I have two jobs sometimes, be the best scientist I can be, and cure society's racial disease. But this is something that everybody has to work towards curing, not just people of color or women in science. Uh, uh, I had to overcome cultural shock uh, going to du Duke University where I felt like I was in the middle of Europe leaving New York City. Uh, and I had to learn how to reach out, not wait for people to come to me, and accept all approaches. So I said I grew up in a Martin Luther King of family, so I accept everybody, but I also do practice a little bit of Malcolm X approach, whereas by, <laughs> any, by any means necessary. So I use molecular biology, genomics, whatever you need to answer a question. And I'll end there with the summary of our, well, well, credits here, and you'll see a summary come up in a minute. So I'm sorry I went 15 minutes over, but I, wow. I think it was important to uh, give that last part some time. Thank you. <laughs> wow, okay, thanks. <laughs> I know some people might have to go, but I guess five minutes of questions. Yeah, five, five minutes, minutes of questions. Yeah. Uh, For those who want to stay. So, um, please. You can ask questions about anything I talked about, all right, including the civil rights era or science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, I was interested, David brought up the possibility of the gene duplications explaining some of the, the, the morphological duplications that you also see. I'm also wondering if you're looking at non-coding regions, like enhancer regions, if you're looking at if you're looking at mis differences in expression of things like SLIT, if you're looking at non-coding regions also to explain some of the more... So, so in those microarray experiments, we actually did have non-coding sequences. And it is the case that, excuse me, not the uh, cortical regions that I colored in green, but the basal ganglia region I colored in purple, there's an overrepresentation of non-coding RNAs that's shared between humans and song-learning birds in their convergence. So it's there. Um, what, um, what's troubling about trying to study them further is that those non-coding sequences tend to be more difficult to assemble. Not all of them, but many of them are, because they have some repetitive sequence or GC-rich content in them. And uh, 
uh, because of that, not, we can't use all these assembled genomes. So we've got to improve assembly quality to compare across all these species to understand their organization better. But they, there is convergence at the gene expression level for, for uh, uh, those genes within the basal ganglia. Yes, Benedict. Yeah, so, so this is another uh, area where better genome assemblies are required because, so you're asking what's causing these genes to be up or down regulated in these specific cells in the speech and song circuits. The obvious thing is going to be something that regulates those genes, the expression, the promoters or some enhancer. And so uh, we're getting good protein coding sequence coverage. We're not seeing convergent mutations in the protein coding sequence, all right? Uh, but we, we're seeing in some of them convergent changes in the regulatory regions, but it's hard to get all species because those regulatory regions are GC rich or also have some kind of microsatellite DNA that's hard to assemble in these genomes. So we need better genome assembly quality, which we're working with PacBio. Uh, to, so, I, so actually, so I'm sequencing more to get at that question. Plus, um, we're doing chip seek experiments. Uh, where, uh, who, how many people have heard of chip seek here? Uh, the, these are uh, methylation marks or, uh, he, or histone acetylation marks in the chromatin surrounding the, the DNA. And we're asking, is there a region that's more methylated or more acetylated that makes this region more active in the human version of the gene for regulating slit one and the songbird version, but not chimpanzee or, uh, or pigeon, for example? And those are ongoing experiments. We don't have the answer yet, except to say that at least in different brain regions, we can f find clear methylation and clear acetylation differences that correlate with gene expression differences. Yes? So along those lines, although you're talking about the molecular mechanisms there, in a sort of general idea of what's the selective pressure from environment that's causing these pathways to emerge or reemerge or be lost, um, do you have any thoughts? Is it kind of a mating preference, or is it Yes, uh, so, so there, I'll quickly answer that in, in several parts because what's, what is the selection pressure? It just reminds me, once again, when we published those multi, several hundred genes that are showing convergence between birds and humans back in 2014, uh, religious groups took that one up too, intelligent design, all right, as the cause of it. So I don't have a, uh, what's a cause, but let's, let's look at the cause at two levels, the, the uh, species or social or whatever level. I think sexual selection is selecting for vocal learning. I think predation might be selecting against it. The more varied your sounds are, the more noticeable you are out in the environment, the more likely you are to be eaten, but the, also the more likely you are to be attracting the opposite sex. So um, but how is that sexual selection leading to selection of changes in the same genes? And not changes not only of just one or two genes, but like of 50 genes. I think what could be going on is once you get this social so selection pressure selecting for one or two mutations in some promoter region or some amino acid sequence, that that then, that change in that protein then selects a change in another protein, which then selects a change in another protein. And you get a series of steps. And if that's true, then we might find that this trait could be a continuum, and mice might have a little bit of it, and that we might find some genetic changes in some species, but not all. But the full vocal learners got past a critical number of genes, uh, and maybe some other species has 10 or 5 of the uh, 50 genes that are changed. And that's what we're looking at uh, now. Do you think it would be like linked to any sort of auditory recognition for, like, or other pathways that would have coevolution? Uh, yes, I don't, but I don't think it's going to be auditory recognition. I, can, I think it's going to be motor learning. Okay. Uh, and because I, th all this has really convinced me, despite the fact that scientists tend to think of motor behavior as something basic, simple, and not at all related to language, I think that is what really makes language special, is motor, motor learning of the voice. Yeah. So a related question, um, presumably the vocal learning pathways are advantageous evolutionarily. So why is it that the close relatives of the vocal learners have not evolved vocal learning and, and is there anything that you have um, found in your work that indicates any sort of predisposition to um, evolving that 
type of behavior in the diverse groups that have evolved it? Yes, there, there's so many hypotheses, especially for humans, of what is the predisposition, like upright walking, tool use, or, or something, or just a, simply a bigger brain. Uh, I'm going to throw out one of mine, and it's still a big hand-waving one. I'm going to say it's the uh, ability to, ev um, I'm going to say to, it's, it's becoming an apex predator. Okay, or, be, or, or being able to evade predators. So if you look at all the mammal vocal learners, humans, elephants, whales, dolphins, right? They're all uh, at the top of the food chain, right? Bats are not at the top of the food chain, but they're the only ones that produce their learned sounds in a high pitch range that hardly anybody else could hear. And so then I think the predators won't hear. It turns out when we generate our new phylogenetic tree, it, it indicated that the common ancestor of songbirds and parrots was an apex predator giant terror bird that used to live on the, in the American continent that killed large mammals, right? I mean, the mammals weren't so large at that time, but this is something bigger than humans. So, so I think vocal learning, there's natural selection for it. I think the question is, what's, I think something is stopping it from being selected. And, and support for that idea comes uh, in the following form. For songbirds, uh, you can take uh, Bengalese finches, you can take a, uh, that's been in captivity for 250 years by humans, not being selected for song. They produce a more complex song repertoire than the wild animals, right? And the females from the wild prefer the domesticated, more complex songs, right? And so uh, it suggests that something in captivity, removing them away from predation, is selected for this more wild song. Even mice in captivity sing more complex songs than wild-type mice. So I, so I think it's a, it's a long answer, but I think it's a, my favorite predisposition. And then hummingbirds are sort of analogous to bats on the bird side? Well, they do sing in a high-pitched range. Uh, actually, when I first, and you can hear them. And I remember when I first heard them when I was in uh, Brazil, I thought I was hearing some insects. Actually, uh, for those maybe here in California, people recognize it quite often, but the Anna's hummingbird sings a lot around here. And when people come here uh, for the first time, they think they're hearing insects, not, not actual a, a, a bird. But that's possible, or it's good at evading predators with its fast flight. But that's the only one that I would say that doesn't fit into this hypothesis as well. All right, there was another hand up somewhere? Yes. Going back to the previous answer, uh, when you spoke about selection of proteins, is that what you mean uh, when you talk about contamination in uh, like the membrane regions in your talk? Uh, what, what I meant by that is, let's say, cells that are adjacent to each other uh, seem to tend to have more similar expression profiles to each other for whatever reason, whatever mechanism that occurs. And so what I'm saying is once slit one, regulatory region impacted its expression specifically in these vocal learning nuclei. Uh, it also impacted uh, that gene and, and a few others in the immediate surrounding, you know, let's say, you know, three, I don't want to say all motor neurons, but the motor neurons immediately surrounding the vocal learning circuit were also showing some specialization of some of these genes, not all of them. And so something about the promoter region in those immediate adjacent neurons, I think, is being affected similarly as in the vocal learning circuit itself. That's one, one hypothesis, or it's an actual result, right? Another hypothesis, and we do see this, in these vocal learning circuit, there are a small number of axons that project out into the surrounding motor circuit. Not many, but they exist. And so maybe the vocal circuit is tapping into other movement systems. Uh, and and one people, some people think that's actually happening for humans, and that's why we gesture as we talk, right? Uh, and gesturing is learned with specific speech sounds. And so uh, <clears throat> those are the two hypotheses that we're working off of now, but nobody's testing them in my lab yet. We need some more money. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one more question, and then I let you go. Yes, go ahead. I have a question. I'm one of uh, Ed Green's postdocs, so I'm re really interested in the uh, pre-Columbian Native American diversity that we know very little about. And uh, for your 23andMe uh, interests, have you found out whether or not, or what their database for yes. Native, have you found that out? Yes, yeah, so I, I, and I've, I've been to several conferences where the, the, the lead scientists from both of those companies, 23andMe and Ancestry, have been and we've talked about this. So um, 
So my, 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 my 1% Native American SNPs that I have in my genome matches mostly people in the middle of the Amazon, okay? And I have no idea how that happened, right? And so according to Ed, right, Ed thinks that, uh, well, in 23 me and Ancestry to answer your question directly, it's mostly non-North American Indians. So uh, uh, Mexico, the Mayans, for example, Amazonians, Alaskans, and Navajo, okay? And Navajo are quite different from, from many others. But um, <clears throat> the thing is, the idea here is uh, uh, um, many scientists uh, believe that uh, some Native Americans come from a single migration uh, from the Bering Strait about 15,000 years ago. And in this 15,000 year period, that's not enough time to create a huge gen genetic diversity, that any, which means that any Native American you sample in the Americas is going to be representative of the entire Americas. All right? And so uh, I just said to Ed, that just seems implausible, right? Uh, but OK, if it's true, right, it would mean that 23andMe results are right. And so, but I said, but why am I not matching the Mayans, OK, or the Eskimos, right? Why, why this? Uh, and so um, <clears throat> I said, what if two things? What if that's wrong? There, is, there are stories, studies out there suggesting earlier migrations, even, even by up to 50,000 years earlier. There are things where they talk about multiple migrations, in, like from Australia and other places. And you know, people migrate in both directions. Why migrate in this one direction, not the other way around? I think that has some, something to do with, um, how can I say? I don't want to call it uh, ju just um, uh, racial egotistical prejudice that thinks people go in one direction. Okay? And so I argue that that's one possibility. Another possibility is that. Um, the, uh, there's greater genetic diversity that occurred after the 15,000 year ago period, just like we find in this bird tree. All right? At, what we find is that after the mass extinction of dinosaurs uh, that wiped out lots of species, there's open land and territory, there's lots of rapid speciation, lots of proteins evolving rapidly, even converging, in a short period of time. And maybe that happens to humans as well. So Ed and I have a dinner bet that uh, he's right and I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> And my, my prediction is that these bone samples won't show similarity to existing Native Americans from North Carolina and, and so forth uh, to, to, um, to the ones that 23andMe had. And his is that they would. And so, uh, and we have a bet uh, for that part. Also, we have a similar history uh, in that, or, or uh, interacting history. So in my oral history, I was told that uh, for my Native American ancestry, they were told to tell the census takers you're not Native American because if you are, you could be killed. And the reason why you could be killed is because you didn't leave with the Trail of Tears, okay, uh, back in the 1800s. Uh, and the Trail of Tears was after the Tuscarora War, which, or Iroquois War in the, in the, um, in the, in the Carolinas. And that, that Tuscarora War was an uprising of Native Americans killing off their slave owners because they were being enslaved at that time in the 1700s. Ed Green says his triple great-grandfather was the first white man killed in the Tuscarora War, and I'm supposed to be descendants of those who stayed behind in North Carolina. Uh, and so, so someone's going to do a documentary to see if we actually, our families really do come together. <laughs> and I'll end off with that long answer right there and find out. <laughs> by, by the way, the first results suggest I'm right. Okay. <laughs>